Good, mo good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth and last webinar of Rayfold, who is titled Solution for a Wide Acceptance of CDW Based Materials and Components. Um, if you missed the other uh, webinar that Ray4 uh, launches, you can find them in the website. And we really encourage you to, to look at them because um, we talk about different topics really connected to the, to the project and interesting for people interested in, uh, in this kind of topic. Uh, I'm Serena and Paul is here with me. Good morning. And as, here, as ACR Plus today, we will support Phoenix in moderating this webinar. So before to pass the floor to Phoenix and to Petra, uh, some information regarding the webinar platform that we are using today. Uh, we, are, uh, we encourage you during the whole webinar to ask questions. Uh, to the speakers, and um, and we will connect all the questions at the end uh, of the, web the webinar because we will have this question time, question and answer time, and so we will uh, be able to ask your question to to the speakers, and, and you will have your answer. So we really encourage you to do all the questions you have. So how uh, basically you should have in the panel on your right a section called questions so just type your question there but please specify uh, the speaker that you are um, that you are addressing your your question so we can uh, send them the question and, and last uh, important thing is that you also have in the panel a little menu called chat you can use that um, for if you are experiencing some technical issue just type there your message and address your message to secretary at ACR Plus. So I will see, it. for example, if you cannot hear me anymore or you, you have trouble uh, seeing the screen and the presentation, just type everything there and we will try to solve your, your problem. Um, so yeah, I'm, I think we are ready to officially start our webinar. So I... Pass the floor to Petra and enjoy to everyone. Petra, the floor is yours. Thank you, Serena. Hi, everyone. And my name is Petra Colantonio, and I'm representing company Phoenix TNT, whose role in the Refor project is as a dissemination and exploitation manager. Today, we have four presentations ahead on topic standardization and uh, uh, quality issues, public authority perspective, and life cycle assessment issues. So let's uh, start. I'm going first to present the REFOR project general introduction. First, I will speak about the background and motivation that stands behind the REFOR project. REFOR is a European Union funded research and innovation project in the topic of circular economy for construction industry, which is according to the European Construction Industry Federation, one of the main drivers of the EU economy, accounting for approximately 9% of the European GDP with 100 billion euro turnover and 6.4% of total employment. However, construction industry is also responsible for the main waste streams, which is construction demolition Petra, waste. Petra, I'm sorry, uh, we cannot see your screen. Um, I don't know if you... Can you... Okay, yeah, great, thank you. I'm sorry for this, I didn't notice. Okay, so let's go back to it. Um, however, the construction industry is also responsible for the main waste streams, which is construction demolition waste, which accounts more or less uh, 800 million tons per year. Most of these waste materials can be recycled in aggregate application, but they are very often confined in low-grade application or landfill. Moreover, there are other materials from construction demolition waste, for example, wood, plastic, glass which uh, has very high recycling potential that is however unexploited so far that's why this scenario european union set up uh, a challenge with the development of energy efficient building concept using new or adapted prefabricated components allowing the reuse and recycling of different materials and structures while reducing energy use and minimizing environmental impact. 
Europe also sets a target of a minimum share of recycled materials in a final product of at least 10 to 15 percent. This challenge was taken up by the REFOR project, which has developed a fully prefabricated, energy efficient, easy dismantable and reusable building made of concrete and timber components containing up to 65 percent by weight of CDW derived materials and structures. Uh, to reach this ambitious goal, a multidisciplinary consortium team was gathered together, coordinated by CETMA from Italy, made of 13 partners from seven different countries across Europe and Taiwan. The project has an overall budget of 4.8 million euros, and it started in September 2016 and will finish in February 2020. As for the reform concept, uh, there are four main pillars supporting the project. The first two are technical and refer to the maximization of CDW recycling and reuse. As for the recycling, RE4 has developed an advanced sorting technologies to improve the overall quality of the CDW derived products. One of the main constraints for growth is the quality, which is not always good enough compared to the virgin materials. At the same time, a reform project has fully exploited the recycled potential of lightweight fraction from CDW, which is currently unexploited. This process has been supported by the assessment of each sorted fraction against relevant national and European specifications with the definition of new quality classes for CDW derived aggregates with the aim to support the development of new standards. The recycling potential has been verified with the development of a set uh, of reform materials and prefabricated elements, incorporating high ratio of CDW derived materials. The reform also aims to improve the state of the art of the recycling rate of 80 to 95 percent and to improve resource efficiency in terms of virgin materials basement of at least 65 percent. In terms of reuse, the REFOR has developed new sustainable strategies for disassembly and reuse of concrete and timber structures and components that reached the end of their service life. Moreover, the project has developed an innovative design concept for a fully prefabricated, easy dismantable REFOR building with up to 90% of reusable structures. The concept has been designed in a way that multiple applications for different building typology will be easy to implement. Uh, the reform have been designed to be tailored to different climatic and structural requirements of different geographic zones across Europe and also outside. Uh, the other two pillars are related to the construction demolition waste ma management and other non-technical barriers. By tackling the CDW management at different level, REFOR aims at contributing to reach the targets of recovery and recycling by 2020 in a way of development of BIM, BIM DSS tool to support uh, building owners and uh, construction demolition companies by providing an estimation of the recycling quantity of CDW that will be generated during the demolition with also possible utilization option and related logistics references. This will also create a new business opportunities as well as new technical skills. The fourth pillar is related to end users acceptance um, when people usually do not want to use material from the waste. That's why REFOR proposes many activities supporting by um, LCA, LCC, social LCA, HSE analysis, performance assessment, certification and standardization strategies. Now let's see the main project uh, achievements and results. So is it possible to build a fully recycled house? Uh, the REFOR project answers yes, it is. Nevertheless, it is crucial to adopt circular approach and to address all the main steps of the construction process. REFOR project has developed solutions in terms of design for re reusable buildings, the construction strategies, sorting, quality assessment, development of materials and prefabricated components, digital tool to support all the actors of the CDW management. All the REFOR solutions have been demonstrated and vali validated in real environment in four REFOR demo buildings, two for renovation and two for new construction. 
On the slide, you can see the Spanish demo building made of prefabricated concrete and timber components, fully reusable with a replacement rate of virgin materials in the range of 50 to 85 percent. Refor is also sharing as much as possible these results over various dissemination and communication channel, including uh, conferences, fairs, workshops, publications, press releases, newsletters, videos, website, social media, and training activities. Now we are moving to the Refor impact. Uh, the European Commission sets the goal at CO2 saving by 30%, energy saving by 20%, and minimum share of recycled materials in a final product at least 10 to 15%. Refor gained CO2 savings more than 40% on average, energy saving on more than 45% on average, and share of recycled materials in a final product of more than 50% on average. More or less, moreover, uh, the reform solution resulted also to be cheaper than conventional solution of more than 15%. As a conclusion, uh, reform project has demonstrated how CDW derived materials and structures can be effectively reintroduced in the production cycles of concrete and timber components with a replacing rates of 50 to 85 percent. From a technical point of view, a fully prefabricated 100 percent reusable building is now reality. But there is a strong need of improvement to waste identification, separation and collection at source, quality assessment and mainly policy and framework conditions. That's all from my side. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Petra, for, for your introduction to the project. So now I give the floor to Linus from Rize. Linus, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Serena. Um, I can't see the sharing screen option. Ah, thank you. <laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, Linus from Rise here. Uh, I hope now you can see my uh, screen which is actually showing the presentation from okay now we go um, so I will talk about uh, standardization and uh, quality issues um, and in this talk you could talk forever about this but I will focus on um, on the use of the mineral CDW uh, materials and its use in concrete So, okay, here we go. Uh, first on background, um, the Waste frame Framework Directive uh, aims on uh, use, uh, recycling and reuse of uh, CDW uh, by at least 70% by 2020, as you probably know. And you may, might know also that uh, the actual figures on reuse and recycling uh, today is very various in the different EU countries, uh, ranging from small uh, figures at 10 up to 90 percent. And generally, these figures are, are quite low, used in um, uh, low quality applications. So, meaning that it is a huge unexploited potential in uh, more recycling of CDW. And uh, also, of course, it's not enough that it is a, a huge potential, but we also need to show to, to exploit that potential that the material is of good quality and it's safe to use for humans and environment. So, and uh, you can say that to just quote two of the issues, uh, the bullet points from the end of, uh, of waste criteria of the waste directive, uh, it need to be shown that the substance that you want to recycle or use um, fulfills the criteria for the for the purpose you want to use it uh, which which is regu um, regulated by for example product standards 
and also the use of the substance or object uh, mustn't be harmful for the environment and uh, humans. And uh, to assess this, uh, you see to the right uh, in the picture, it's a washing plant, recycling plant from uh, our project partner CDE. And here actually the mineral fraction is uh, washed, which means that um, many water soluble components uh, are washed away and is collected in the silt and clay fraction, we, which we'll, we don't use uh, for this purpose. So leaving behind a quite clean, um, coarser aggregate fractions from 63 microns and, and up. And you also see here, for example, uh, chlorides and sulfates, which is also not wanted so much in, in concrete. Uh, the, the values for these are quite low in the coarser mineral fractions because most of it has been um, washed away to end up in the silt and clay. And you see uh, in, in below um, that in the silt and clay fraction, it's much higher uh, chloride and sulfate amounts. And um, probably also many of the water soluble organic components that potentially could be there and also heavy metals could be washed away to that silt and clay fraction that you need to, to put in landfill probably. Um, but this is actually showing that uh, by, by recycling processes, wa washing and so on, you can actually get a, a good material that is not harmful for environment and humans. Then of course you need to assess this uh, for each material with leaching, uh, leaching test according to the standards that you use in, uh, in place of use. So, but uh, in this talk we will focus on uh, the technical aspects of this, um, uh, of this use. So basically replacing partially or fully virgin aggregates with uh, recycled CDW aggregates for use in concrete. So, and this, the use of uh, aggregates, whether they are primary virgin or if they are recycled secondary, is regulated by a few standards, which are very important in the, the, uh, this aspect. And you see them here. It's the horizontal standard for concrete, which is called common rules for precast concrete products. It's the specific concrete standard, EN 206, which is very central and also the uh, standard for uh, aggregates for concrete, EN 12620. And this applies to concrete, whether it's uh, mixed on site or if it's uh, produced in a precast plant or if it's ready mix. And uh, also furthermore, uh, EN 12620 is harmonized, which means that it's, you need to CE mark uh, CDW that you want to use as concrete uh, concrete aggregate according to the uh, construction product regulations and also um, aggregates for using concrete they are in the AVCP system 2 plus uh, and AVCP is short for assessment and verification of constancy uh, of performance and what this means in practical is that it's not only enough to see e-market products or your aggregates, you also need to uh, get a certificate by a notified body. Okay, um, what's the difference then when you, you want to use CDW as aggregate in your concrete? Um, there's a basic set of properties you, that you always need to, to test and um, uh, declare in your CE mark and your uh, declaration of performance. Uh, but there are some properties that adds uh, to this list. For example, you should always, uh, when working with CDW, uh, you, you should, as until opposite proven, you should consider your aggregate alkali silica reactive. Uh, you also must um, classify your CDW aggregate according to a specific standard for coarse recycled aggregates 
which is called NEN933. And this standard, uh, it's um, basically the backbone or what uh, this, it might be one of the most important properties, you could say, of these CDW aggregates, because it's in, in turn, the classification by this method, in next step, um, the quality class uh, that your, um, the assessment of quality class is based on this test. So what you see here is an example from uh, a CDW batch we worked with, which is called UK batch one. And what you actually do in this method, you take your, uh, a, a certain amount of CDW stated in the standard, and then you actually by hand sort it in different uh, material uh, types. Um, so for example, you sort in unbound stone, in one pile and concrete in one pile, lightweight concrete in another, bricks and slag in one, bituminous material is also separated in one pile, uh, glass and so on and so on. And then you weigh these fractions and you get what you see to the right. You actually get uh, a composition, uh, what the composition is of your particular material um, with respect to different types of material. So this particular material, you see that it's actually dominated the green um, color in the figure to the right. It's dominated by unbound stone. And next comes uh, concrete, crushed concrete, about 20%. And there, then there's also a, quite some amounts of, of bricks and tiles and bituminous material. Uh, another difference when using CDW is that you can have you ha can have quite a, a wide var variation even from si same uh, recycling plant and therefore uh, in general there is increased test frequency uh, stated in uh, in the standard until it's also based that if you can show by these repeated tests that it's uh, a smaller variation you can also of course uh, go down in test frequency from this one Okay, but what's the idea with this? Uh, the thing is that these, uh, what you say, the composition of the CDW due to different components is, um, that's what the classification system is based on because when you use CDW as concrete aggregate, you need to classify it in, today what exists in the standard is two types, type A and type B, where type A is the better quality one and type B a, a bit lower quality. And uh, actually this is based uh, also on density and content of water soluble sulfates and so on, but uh, main um, point that decides is what kind of components you have. So for example, you see to the left, RC, that's the amount of concrete particles. And RB is, percent of bricks and so on and so on. So you need to keep, you to have a high quality, you need a lot of concrete particles or unbound stone because in general, these, these types of material give a better quality to the material. Whereas if you have more bricks, bituminous material, glass and so on, this in general lower the quality of the aggregates. Uh, however, this is not since this particular standard is not harmonized. Uh, this is not used in all EU. Uh, it's um, this, the use of this system. It's uh, delegated to each country to decide by national provision how they want to use it. So here you can see a summary of many different member states. Uh, the lines above, you see what what the standard actually EN 206, what it says. But then you can, um, um, for example, Belgium uses it uses it uh, its own system in some way. Um, Czech and, and Finland they use 
they actually use the EN26 system, but okay, they're, then different other countries, they use their own system. So, but um, the thing is that from RE4 project, based on um, all the work we have done, and also that we think that um, to get um, a more refined system where with, with uh, more classes, uh, where you can actually get rewarded um, by good quality, we think it's easier to get acceptance by all EU member states to actually uh, in some days in the future have a common system for this so you can um, assess quality of your CDW aggregates in the same way in in each over il, uh, entire EU. Uh, so we actually in the project we have made a suggestion on revising the system which is basically by adding and also refining the classes and uh, this is motivated by all the work we have done we have worked with uh, a lot of uh, CD, different cdw batches with full characterization of them and also studied how they perform in uh, diff different types of concrete in ordinary vibrated concrete in self-compacting concrete but also high performance concrete and this is work we have uh, we from rice have done in uh, collaboration with queen's university of belfast and the main uh, you can say that also another goal of this, uh, not only get wider acceptance, is that we want to reward uh, ambitious producers. So if you sort good, you get a higher aggregate quality class and you will get the higher technical and economic value. So this is the, the new suggestion. You see type A and type B, these are the existing ones. Uh, in red text, that's all we have changed uh, in our um, suggestion. So type A and B, uh, we have modified um, some parameters and also we have introduced two new classes, type A plus and type L. Uh, type L is for lightweight concrete. That's why you see density requirement is below 2000 kilogram per cubic meter. Um, type A, that's a, that is a top notch quality uh, aggregate, which is basically as, as good as a uh, virgin aggregate or maybe in some case even better so uh, the requirements for this class is very high uh, you should have at least 95 percent of it should be unbound stone or and or crushed concrete uh, it's not allowed to have uh, it's only up to to five percent that can be other things like bricks uh, and it's also requirements on that on maximum five percent water absorption so this is really type A plus. Can you sort your material and get that one? You should have a very high value material. Uh, we also suggest the revision of the present um, um, classification system. Um, you see in top of this table, you see for the two, two existing or present classes type A and B, you see how much, how much you can replace uh, virgin aggregates by cdw aggregates with respect to exposure class of the new concrete so uh, the, the exposure class for for concrete is basically the chemical and physical environment that in which the new concrete will be used so x zero to the left that's basically indoor application where it's not exposed to weather and rain and frost and and so on and salts and in the other extreme to the right you have classes uh, corresponding to uh, bridges and harbor installations and so on so going from from today where we where you can replace only up to 50 percent even in indoor use uh, we make a proposal based on the four new classes how uh, on, on a, an, another different type of uh, replacement levels and we also add uh, additional requirements that can come into force when you want to use in a, in a high um, 
in a higher exposure class. So uh, just to make to give you an example of of uh, how the quality class of the material or the quality of the material, how it affects the use in in concrete. Um, so we have made a lot of trials with different type of of uh, CDW, and our goal with making the concrete has always been to fulfill the requirement from in industry. So we have industrial partners. Uh, concrete partners that has said that we need these and this and this uh, values on, on the properties for the for the fresh concrete and for the hardened concrete and you need to fulfill that to get the same figure or above so that's what uh, these and we have checked how much can we replace uh, virgin aggregates with cdw and still keeping these figures or, or even get better higher uh, compressive strength or uh, even better workability. So two different CDW batches. Um, the one to the left, it's basically 90% of 98% um, of concrete and unbound stone, uh, whereas the uh, one to the right is almost uh, yeah, it's 90%, a little bit less um, with unbound stone and concrete but also has quite a lot uh, bricks and tiles and bituminous material and glass. So, and here you see the existing class, classes. Of course, I could show this also for the new ones, but okay, I used the present system. And when checking this, you see that the one to the left, it classified as type A since, since it has so much uh, uh, concrete and unbound stone. And the one to the right classify as uh, um, B, since it has uh, a little bit too much bituminous material, which uh, area A, which is 4% here. Uh, when we worked on, uh, for example, high performance concrete, we managed to use, to replace 90% of the virgin aggregates. Uh, that is also quite a lot of the fine fraction. Um, with this uh, aggregate and uh, for the type b we managed to replace 50 percent only uh, keeping the same properties as as the concrete producer requires and this actually it shows that uh, what we aimed for that high sorting ambitions leads to higher aggregate quality and if so you get a higher technical value and with that hopefully also a higher economic value that people are ready to pay for this so uh, to uh, finalize and wrap it up um, next steps this is only an example we're actually also working on yet another revision of these quality classes here for uh, uh, for a final suggested revision and also working committees on uh, on different test methods uh, for aggregates and, and how they need to be adjusted or modified uh, when applied on CDW. But uh, for now, uh, much focus is to, to uh, cooperate and, and be active in uh, the technical committee for concrete, uh, which is uh, technical committee 104. And we have a few different ways into that via the project uh, we at RISE, we are a member in the Swedish National Mirror Committee. Uh, there is also a liaison between the RE4 project and TC104 uh, through Queen's University of Belfast. And uh, myself is actually uh, the Swedish represent in, uh, in the TC104 task group on recycled aggregates. So we will try to work in these forums and um, try to make an uh, impact in the future. So if you have questions or even suggestions that we can bring to this or, or suggestions on other parts, we can go to uh, implement this uh, in a better way. Uh, they are very welcome. So I thank you for now and looking forward to any questions later. Thank you.
Thank you to you, Linus, for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, so now I pass to the next speaker, which is with me, Paolo from ACR Plus. So um, I give him the floor. Thank you, Serena. Good morning, everyone. And thank also to the previous speakers for such inspiring presentations. So I'm going to talk about the role of public authorities to develop acceptance of CDW-based materials and components. In particular, I would like to put the focus on the local and regional authorities, since ACR Plus is a network of cities and regions. Here you have some information about the network with more than 100 members in 25 countries sharing the ambitions to design strategies and implement actions towards a sustainable resource management. This network offers uh, actually the opportunity to test the perception of the RE4 project, as well as disseminate outstanding results and recommendations in terms of, for instance, of uh, CDW aggregates quality classes we heard uh, in the previous presentation delivered by Linus. So, the results of RE4 reveal promising opportunities. The local and regional authorities can contribute to accelerate and scale up such outcomes. But some questions come up, such as, for instance, how can local and regional authorities support the process? What are the enabling factors? What are the barriers? What are the instruments? We try to answer to these questions with a study we published last December titled Sustainable Construction Guidelines for Public Authorities, a Circular Economy Perspective. The circular economy principles can play much of a role in this transition. In these guidelines, the focus is put, is put on uh, circularity and material resources efficiency. Social and cultural aspects are also crucial to design and implement effective solutions for citizens, achieving inclusiveness and economic cohesion. This study is meant to describe some relevant instruments that the local and regional authorities can implement to trigger, make durable, and replicate sustainable circular economy processes in the construction sector. The document is divided in three main parts. The first one refers to an overview of what sustainable construction sector stands for, starting from the current state of play and moving to the circular economy principles. The second part contains guidelines to develop effective strategies. And finally, boxes containing good practices complete the third section. There are several steps in a building's lifetime, design and manufacture of products, followed by construction, occupancy, maintenance and renovation, repurposing, and finally the construction disassembly. Also, urban planning plays a role to analyze the context in which a building is integrated. The construction value chain is indeed a complex system and it's not always clear where and how the local and regional authorities can make the difference. To figure this out, in the study we cross-analyzed several strategies developed by local and regional authorities addressing the circularity in the construction sector. To name a few, Paris, Amsterdam, Glasgow, Brussels Capital Region, Volum Region, have designed and have been implementing interesting strategies. Some of the common drivers we found out are employment generation for local communities, strong involvement of citizens, civil society and private stakeholders, heritage and social opportunities, and clear goals and political commitments. To better explore the factual that seem enabling positive impacts, we categorize the cross-cutting themes to be included in an effective strategy. For each of the cross-cutting themes, some good, good practices have been reported to turn into concrete actions, the analysis, and to inspire the transferability and replicability of such practices. A sustainable construction strategy cannot be developed without having first identified the priorities and challenges which are specific to the territory. The benefits of a circular economy need to be shared widely with clear and relevant communication to the sector to ensure greater adoption. 
The next logical step is to go beyond the simple communication and ensure lasting changes with continued education. The H2020 Urban Winds project, putting the urban metabolism in the focus and the brick project, a tool addressing the education pillar, providing a platform for classes and trainings, are two good practices that can boost acceptance in the CDW-based materials and components. When it comes to research and innovation, of course, projects such as uh, REFOR can feed with innovative solutions the local and regional policies, supporting them with consistent technical results. For instance, to design criteria to be included in public procurement. The involvement of local stakeholders through co-creation participant processes is as well a key factor to develop acceptance about circularity. The living labs of the FISA project and the activities carried out in the municipality of Prato in Italy involving the local textile industry are significant examples. Also, the business support is another driver has revealed good results in terms of circularity development and commitment to pave the route. The strategy of Glasgow has been included among the good practices. Setting up uh, financial incentives can also have positive results, such as the Trustman scheme in the Flemish region that support the selective collection of CDW, guarantee higher quality and opportunity for the recycle of uh, CDW aggregates and the better acceptance. Local and regional authorities can facilitate the acceptance of the CDW also through policies and regulation. For instance, the bylaw end of waste criteria for recycling aggregates in the Basque Country or the compulsory pre audit for the construction sites in France are relevant examples. Public procurement is uh, one of the many instruments actually that um, local and regional authorities have to boost the acceptance about CDW. The guidelines developed by Zero Waste Cotran offer concrete tools to support such processes. As a conclusion, I would like to list the three main points. A strong political commitment with clear goals is an effective starting point to set up an effective strategy. Make sustainable construction one of the priorities of the political agenda will boost concrete actions involving the whole stakeholders ecosystem. Public procurement is an effective instrument to draw the way forward and social acceptance should be put in the main focus of the strategies developed by local and regional authorities. So we encourage you to download the publication, checking out our website, and we are open to any comments, suggestions and ideas may you have. In the slide, there is also the direct link to download the document. So thank you very much and uh, I'm available for any question you may have. Thank you. So thank you, Paolo. We can pass to our next speaker, which is going to be the last one. So I encourage you um, to send questions if you have, so because you still have time. Um, so I pass the floor to Maria Chiara from Strat. Yeah. So, Maria Chiara, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Serena, for organizing the webinar. Uh, my name is Maria Chiara Caruso from Stress Star. And uh, in this webinar, I will discuss the sustainability, the related methodologies, and their applications in order to quantify the sustainability of the products developed in the RE4 project. Uh, firstly, I would like to briefly introduce Stress Car. Uh, the Italian acronym Stress stands for Development of Research and Technologies for Sustainable and Seismically Safe Buildings. Um, Stress is a research and technology hub founded in Naples in 2010 and composed of universities, research institutes, and private sector firms. Uh, and you can see here the civil partners. Stress aims at exploiting competitiveness and innovation in the construction sector, fostering business ventures in high technology sectors, promoting research, innovation, continuous education and dissemination of results, supporting international business and research activities. 
Uh, indeed, uh, areas of interest are sustainability, safety and resilience, protection and conservation of buildings uh, of historic and, and uh, artistic interest, uh, internationalization and professional training. Uh, within the RE4 project, Stress has analyzed the sustainability of the RE4 products. Uh, so let's focus on uh, the sustainability assessment. Uh, last decade has been characterized by growing attention on sustainable development, which has been uh, defined as the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations uh, to meet their own needs. Three aspects are involved in the, uh, in the sustainable development, which are the society, the planet, and the profit. Only when all the three aspects are considered, we can talk about sustainability. Why? We need to focus our uh, efforts on uh, sustainability development. Obviously, because we need to take care of the social, economic, and environmental development of uh, human activities. Uh, but also because of the European and global agreements that, and the related investments that have been and still are carried out to guarantee a sustainable approach to global growth. Indeed, in 2015, the United Nations approved the 2030 Agenda and the related 17 sustainable goals to be reached in, uh, by uh, 2030. How we can approach to the sustainable development? Well, we can focus on innovation, safety, uh, resource efficiency, and uh, others. And in case uh, new products and services are realized, a life cycle approach can be helpful. Uh, indeed, according to the life cycle thinking, we can analyze a product or service by looking at each stage of its life, imagining that it has a birth, a service life, and a death. Uh, therefore, consider the, considering the three aspects of the sustainability, the assessment can be performed by using a set of proven methodologies, which measure and analyze the consequences of products we want to investigate. The evaluation of the environmental impacts, such as the global warming potential, the uh, ozone depletion potential, the, uh, the acidification, um, and can be performed according to the uh, ESO 14040 and 14044, referring to each stage of the product life cycle. The life cycle costing instead aims at the assessment of economic impacts related to products and services from the entire life cycle. Uh, then the social life cycle assessment methodology allows to analyze the social and socioeconomic aspects associated with the product or service and to evaluate the potential impacts during the entire life cycle. Uh, this methodology uh, derives from the UNEP and set guidelines for the social life cycle assessment of products. Uh, the three aspects of the sustainability can be combined to reach uh, a final sustainability score by using the shortest column method uh, that, we, uh, that will be discussed uh, better later on. Uh, all the three methodologies just presented are based on the ISO 14040, which identifies the following four steps for the, entire, for the life cycle based sustainability assessment. The Gone Scope definition, in which the reason carried out the study and its intended use um, are described. Uh, here, the uh, reference uh, unit and the system boundary are specified. The inventory, in which the product system and its constituent unit processes are described, including the inputs and outputs to conduct the analysis. Uh, then the impact assessment, in which the magnitude and the significance of the impacts associated with the inputs and outputs uh, are evaluated. And finally, the interpretation, in which conclusions and the recommendations are made. Uh, the, framework, the framework on the bottom right uh, shows the procedure for the sustainability assessment. So we have a common goal and scope identified, uh, and uh, inventories and the impact assessments are performed for each methodology. Uh, results are finally combined to provide a final score. In the first stage of the LCA, the LCC, and the social LCA, um, there is the definition of the goal scope. Um, as previously stated, the functional unit and the system boundary have to be set. 
The functional unit is the quantified performance of a product system for use as a reference unit. Examples can be cubic meter of material, one square meter of panel, one kilogram of material, uh, one unit of product, uh, which have some specific features. The system boundary is the set of criteria specifying which unit processes are part of a product system. For example, only the production stage, the production and the end of life stage, or all the stage of the life cycle. Uh, indeed, for the construction sector, the EN 15.978 helps in identifying the phases involved in the life cycle of the buildings and infrastructures. The life cycle of infrastructures can be seen as divided into four main modules. Uh, the product stage, in green, including the raw material supply, uh, the transport of raw materials to manufacturing site, and the manufacturing uh, of the products. Then we have the uh, construction stage in blue, including the transport uh, to the construction site and the construction itself, such as the installation. Then we have the use uh, phase in yellow, including all the operations made uh, on the infrastructure during its lifetime. And then we have the end of life, including the construction, transport, to waste management, waste processing, and disposal. Uh, moreover, after the end of life, it can be considered also another stage of the life cycle, which is the possible reuse, recovery, recycling of some material components, including in the products under investigation. Each phase of the system boundary identifies the single unit process. In the inventory phase, the inputs and the outputs for each unit process in terms of uh, material flows, uh, so that raw materials, water, waste, emissions, and the energy flow, electricity, gas, and others, have to be determined and quantified. Uh, all inputs and outputs data can be collect, uh, collected through uh, questionnaires to be sent to producers and their suppliers. Uh, an example is here provided and referred to the data collection questionnaire within the Annex A of the ISO 14044. Uh, the impact assessment stage allows to quantify the environmental impacts generated uh, by the life cycle of the product under investigation. Uh, we have several impact assessment methodologies developed in the last decades. Uh, one of the most widespread uh, is the APD, which stands for Environmental Product Operation, uh, according to which seven impact, uh, impact categories are identified and quantified. Uh, being global warming potential, uh, due to the pollution potential, the acidification potential, the eutrophication potential, the photochemical zone creation potential, then we have the abiotic, abiotic depletion resources and fossil fuels. Uh, looking now at the economic sustainability, the evaluation of the impacts is performed considering the total costs related to the product life cycle. Uh, once all the costs related to each life cycle stage are identified, they are assembled according to the net present value methodology, which also actualizes future costs. Therefore, the total cost is provided by the formulation here provided, uh, namely the sum of the products between the cost of each stage and the discount factor. Uh, the latter depending on the annual real discount rate and the number of years in the future. As I stated before, the social life cycle assessment allows to analyze the social and socioeconomic effects associated with the product or service and to evaluate the uh, potential impacts, which can be positive or negative, during the entire life cycle. The social LCA analysis is performed in accordance with the UNEP and set up guidelines for social life cycle assessment of products uh, methodology and uh, related methodological sheets. In addition, since there are no international accepted impact assessment methods, we use the social impact assessment method developed by Green Delta TC. Uh, so the social life cycle assessment is performed considering as per stage the inventory based on same uh, LCA goal scope, uh, 
um, which is uh, developing the following uh, stage. The identification of the stakeholder categories involved in each product life cycle phase, and they can be the local community, uh, the value chain actors, the consumers, the workers, and for the society. Then we have the identification of special themes of interests, uh, the so-called subcategories, um, for each uh, stakeholder, uh, such as local employment, suppliers, relationships, working hours, and others. Uh, finally, the identification of indicators for each subcategory, such as, uh, such as workers' freedom to join units of their choosing in the freedom of association subcategory related to the worker stakeholder. Then the impact assessment is performed for the first definition of performance assessment indicators, PA, based on the, indica uh, on the indicators previously identified, and the impact assessment, PA, of the company with regard to the selected impact categories, being working conditions, uh, health and safety, human rights, socioeconomic repercussions, indig indigenous rights, and governance. <coughs> Once all the impacts are evaluated, which are environmental, economic, and social impacts, they need to be homogenized to provide a final score. This can be performed through the shortest column method, which starts from the results of the three analyses, which are values from 1 to 6 for social CA, being 1 for very good and 6 for bad, single weighted score for environmental LCA, being the highest value, the highest environmental impact, Financial value for the LCC being the highest value, the highest economic impact. LCA and LCC results are imaginized in the range 1 to 6, being one for the less impactful and expensive solution. Uh, and that they are simply summed. Let's go now to the, <coughs> the RF4 project. Uh, six panels uh, designed within the RF4 project have been analyzed. Three timber based panels being the timber facade panel for cold climates, timber facade panel for warm climates, and internal partition wall. And three concrete based panels being concrete uh, facade panel for cold climates, uh, concrete facade panel for warm climates, and ventilated facade for refurbishment. They have been compared with common reference panels on the European market with the same functional performance, such as structural and thermal performances. In this slide, the timber-based panels are shown, considering their cross-section. Moreover, the functional unit is reported, which is one square meter of panel having 0.14 and 0.25 watts for square, per square meter Kelvin as thermal transmittance, for cold climates and warm climates, respectively, and one square meter of panel with the purpose to separate two rooms and to provide a surf supporting structural system for the internal partition wall. <clears throat> the main differences between conventional and R4 solutions uh, are the substitution of some conventional components with the ones developed within the R4 project and based on construction demolition waste. Uh, an example is the use of construction demolition waste timber for studs uh, or weatherboard instead of virgin timber elements. In case of internal partition wall, the RF solution is compared with traditional partition wall, mainly made of steel and gypsum materials. The concrete based panels are herein shown. The functional units are reported, which are one square meter of panels of panel having uh, 0.21 watts per square meter Kelvin, Kelvin as uh, thermal transmittance for cold climates and 0.34 watts per square meter Kelvin uh, as thermal transmittance for warm climates and for ventilated facade panel. The main difference between the conventional and the R4 solutions uh, is the concrete used for inner and outer layers which is made of aggregates coming from the construction and demolition waste. For the ventilated facade panel, the main differences between the conventional and the solutions is the insulation layer and the composition of the other layer. Two allocation methods have been analyzed, which are the cutoff and the system expansion. Indeed, the R4 elements have been designed to be disassembled and reused in another product system. 
whilst the conventional elements have been assumed to be, to be demolished and disposed of after 50 years of service life. So, in case cutoff is considered for the Arico solution, the analysis is cut at the selective demolition stage, whilst for the conventional solution, the analysis includes the disposal process. In case of system expansion, for the RE4 solution, the system boundary is expanded to account for the elements and usability and include other service life in another product system. And after one, 100 years, uh, the RE4 elements are disposed. For the conventional solutions, the environmental impacts of the conventional elements are doubled to reflect 100 years of RE4 elements service life and allows uh, and allow comparisons. For all the panels, the system boundary is uh, realized. And as an example, this slide allows the, uh, the, the this slide uh, shows the system boundaries for the conventional and RE4 solutions of the complex panels, considering the two different allocation methodologies. For this analysis, production and end-of-life phases are considered, including the transport and the energy inputs. So the environmental, economic, and social impacts have been evaluated for the six panels in their conventional and RE4 versions, according to the methodologies described before. Uh, in this slide, some examples on the results are shown. Uh, when considering the timber panel in cold climate in terms of LCA, so you can visit it, it is shown that for five out of six environmental impacts, the RE4 panel has lower values, ranging from 27 to 53 percent of impacts generated by the conventional panel. Looking at the LCC results, uh, the life cycle costs related to RE4 panels are 70, uh, 57 percent of the ones declared uh, related to the conventional panel. In terms of social impacts, considering the production phase, both conventional and RE4 solutions of timber panels have positive impacts for all the stakeholders and most of the corresponding subcategories. The only hot spot which uh, can be highlighted uh, with a rank equal to 4 uh, is the one related to consumption of raw materials during conventional production process. Therefore, looking at the uh, overall uh, results, it can be studied that replacing uh, virgin raw materials with secondary raw materials in RE4 panels resulted in environmental and economic improvements compared to the conventional ones. Moreover, social impacts are positive for all the product and phases, uh, except uh, the end of life phase uh, of conventional panels. This slide uh, summarizes the impact improvements gained uh, for all the RE4 panels when compared to the conventional solutions. Uh, looking at the global warming potential, the fossil embodied energy, the costs, and the social impacts. Uh, the four, uh, looking at the overall panels, when the RE4 solutions are compared with conventional ones, reduction of more than 40% of global warming potential, fossil embodied energy, and social impacts are observed. Moreover, a reduction of more than 15% of costs are observed. In this last slide, uh, the final uh, sustainability score is shown. For each panel, conventional solution provides the worst sustainability score. Precisely, RE4 solutions lead from 38 to 64% uh, sustainability improvement when compared to conventional solutions. I would like to thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm here for any questions. Thank you, Maria, for your presentation, and thanks all presenters if we've finished our session today. Now is the time for the questions. So my first question goes to Linus. Um, when tackling the topic standardization and certification, what was the most challenging for the REFOR project? Wow, that, that was a <laughs> um, tough uh, question. Yeah, the, the most challenging uh, in general is, of course, that it's um, you need access to these uh, standardization committees, and um, that these, uh, yeah, that they they actually are open and, and uh, available and in, interesting in hearing. That is, of course, 
something you, you need to work on on uh, long term. Uh, but particularly for this project on on shorter term, uh, uh, it's it's hard to say. It's it's important also to know that that uh, what we actually do in the project is not a certification because that we we can what we do is that we suggest for uh, for the part the industrial partners how they can how they need to modify their their uh, CE marks and uh, declaration of performance and so on and their documentation uh, in order to cope uh, to uh, when using uh, CDW in their uh, products. Um, but what we what we mostly work on is these uh, standardization issues. So yeah, I don't know if that was so, so rewarding answer, but um, I think that's that's the hardest thing to that, that you need to work on on long term also after the project. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge. Yes. <laughs> yes, very well. Thank you, Linus. And my second question goes to Paolo. Uh, we've heard today that public authorities are very important in moving forward towards a sustainable construction sector. How they can actually stimulate secondary raw materials markets? Thank you, Peter, for your question. Yeah, actually, um, we think that uh, public procurement uh, is an effective instrument to support the process. Uh, for instance, properly setting the technical uh, specification, uh, um, for instance, also the um, setting the minimum recycling contents, maybe in some of the application could, could, could be useful. And also the, um, the awarding criteria uh, could uh, play a role. Many regional authorities have uh, also actually the power and the responsibilities to set the legal framework so in terms of uh, CDW management, bans uh, and taxes uh, for landfilling uh, can boost the source separation of CDW and the proper sorting. But it's true that to, to actually boost the market of uh, CDW for high quality applications, not only for some backfilling operation or low value application, it's very important to set up the schemes incentivating the use of high quality materials. Then also local and regional authorities can play a role to set up platforms to involve the local stakeholders, supporting them with trainings and communication. And because we, we have seen that in many, many countries, in many regions, uh, these kind of platforms have been showing promising results. Perfect. Thank you very much, Paolo. And my last question goes to Maria. Uh, besides the life cycle assessment and life cycle cost assessment, um, were there any other analysis performed for the reform project and the results? Uh, well, actually, we uh, we were looking at this um, analysis. Um, why? Because uh, they are like the, the, the most widespread ones. And uh, these kind of analysis uh, for the sustainability, uh, well, are uh, worldwide accepted. Uh, when looking at the sustainability of the products, it's uh, always hard to, um, to um, uh, let's say, to, to have a, a common, um, like approach, so we uh, decided to to follow the, the most widespread approach. So uh, using this uh, this analysis, yes. Yes, thank you very much, Maria. And we are actually at the end of our webinar today. As I see, we don't have any any other questions. So I would like uh, once again to thank all um, very much, um, especially the speakers for their effort and also those who participated and listened today. This session was recorded as Serena mentioned and will be uploaded into the Refor Project website and also the YouTube channel. And to follow the project, do not forget to subscribe to our newsletter or social media in order to be updated about the latest news once again, thank you all and I wish you a great rest of the day.